The Monerotopia Price Report segment is sponsored by Local Monero. Avoid using KYC exchanges. Buy and sell Monero directly for fiat, peer-to-peer. What's up, guys? Morning, buddy. Yo, morning. How's it going? How's everything going? Pretty good. How you doing? I'm good. Just trying to um, spend some time on Twitter, convert some maximalists, or <laughs> at least convert the people watching those threads that are not themselves maximalists and on the fence. How's that going? <laughs> uh, you know, it, it's a good practice and patience. <laughs> I mean, what, what's your feel? I feel like there's there's definitely a lot more converts, right? Than than I've I think. Seen. In the past, I think there's quite a lot of Bitcoiners that are not maximalists that are like basically our friends. Mm -hmm. Uh, so want to maximize those relationships, yeah, and uh, you know, continue trying to sort of draw out the arguments. And you know, I mean, it's it's really like they make it very easy <laughs> to to respond in kind of a, a rude fashion, which is you know, maybe a little bit of a tendency I have to get sarcastic when uh, you know, in response. So it's like a good it's a good exercise in patience, just like, like nope, just gonna stay on topic, not gonna. Not going to let it get away from me. Just try and uh, keep drawing back to the arguments. Have people been blocking you or you're, you're not too badly? Okay. Although Chris Black recently was was kind of interesting. <laughs> I didn't what? even like what? I wasn't even like that mean to him. I, I didn't even say anything too terrible. He um, he was like, well, why don't you know the val So it was about tornado cash. He's like, well, why aren't the validators in Ethereum? You know, the miners, basically. It's like uh, those are the ones that should be responsible. And I was like, no, Chris, Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act like prohibits that. It's the same reason that you don't arrest the Google CEOs for people sending like criminal, you know, conducting criminal activity on the Google platform. Um, that was actually one of the like fundamental pieces of the Internet that sort of gave gave us the ability or I should say the corporations, the ability to build out, um, you know, these big platforms because you don't hold them criminally or legally liable. Right. Um, and as I, I, don't I, know, said for, I don't think that sorry. applies to money laundering, though. Right. Um, yeah. I mean, there are some things it doesn't apply to, like IP. Um, but I mean, generally in the states in, in like they've erred on the side of not holding these companies um, criminally liable or responsible. So it's like that's something he should know for, you know, someone that's like into technology as much as he says that he is. So I kind of well, I don't I even said that. That, that would warrant a block. I mean, <laughs> yeah, like, I know. What? I respond a lot to his stuff. He doesn't. Okay. He doesn't like that I'm um, Ethereum curious. Okay. <laughs> that you're engaging. It's yeah. funny because he was supposed to come on the show. We might get him on uh, this week. We might do a Monero talk interview with him. So. Oh, cool. Well, I promise not to, you know, <laughs> get on, hop on at the end and start heckling or anything. <laughs> yeah, because I wanted to bring him on to talk about the tornado cash stuff because I, my understanding, he does follow pretty closely. But hmm. if he's ignoring um, comments like yeah. you're. <laughs> um, it happens. It happens. Twitter, man. It's it's not it's not the best medium for cordial conversation. Right? Really not. Really <laughs> not. Yeah, you've only got 280 characters, and you're like, yeah. I can uh, shit post, uh, and that's easy. Or I can like really like narrow down my argument to the absolute yeah. core parts of it. I'll just shit post. Yeah, I found myself really not tweeting much at all recently in the last couple of months. It's just like. It's just exha exhausting because, like, I'm sitting there. I'm like gonna tweet. I'm like, but do I want to deal with the responses and what? I, it's like it's just not worth it. It's yeah. I'll, I'll get to it again though because we gotta we gotta continue to fight the fight because there are a lot of noobs out there that end up you know reading your. You're not gonna convince the maxi, right? We know that, but you'll no. you might convince the uh, the unindoctrinated. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I even saw someone on Facebook recently that. Uh, she was like, yeah, I, I met a maximalist in real life, and it was just really kind of weird. She was kind of weirded out by the sort of evangelistic religiosity of it all. So, And she's like someone that's been in the freedom community for a while, so I thought that was interesting um, that she's she's in the freedom community for years, but hasn't really, like, she doesn't know about the maximalist versus, you know, basically kind of everyone else <laughs> um, yeah, thing going on. So yeah. Yeah, I think there's still, like, there's still people that are that could be interested and that are probably watching from time to time yeah there was that one guy who tweeted uh it was something with trump i think you even responded it and he just responded to it he was like oh too bad he didn't like hold his money in bitcoin like referencing that the u.s government's gonna like try to confiscate his funds 
And I was like, yeah, because nobody's ever confiscated Bitcoin before. And he's like, well, give me one example where they've confiscated Bitcoin from somebody who's holding it, you know. Uh, and uh, I posted the article where it was like, you know, billions of dollars worth of Bitcoin that was confiscated, you know, examples. <laughs> apartment. Yeah, it's uh, not hard. You didn't have to dig deep or anything. Like hardware wallets, right? It wasn't from exchanges and whatnot. And uh, he's like, well, that, that equally applies to Monero. Like, he, he just still, like, they refuse to get it. They refuse to get And I think you made a comment, right? About how, um, what, what was your comment? You're, you're like, oh, like, comparing Bitcoin to real estate versus Monero to Bitcoin, right? I think was your... Yeah, I said, I said, listen, we can admit that Bitcoin is harder to seize than real estate if you can admit that Monero is harder to seize than Bitcoin. But, right. Uh, I guess that was too much of an ask. I don't understand the disconnect there. They're not, they're not willing to seed on that. Like, they, uh, I don't get the logic there. I don't, I don't well, get it. You can't, um, no. you can't convince a man um, to believe something when his salary depends on him not believing it. <laughs> I don't know who said that. Billions and somewhere billions in the Mark Twain era. Dollars worth of Bitcoin have been confiscated for people. And because of the fact that it's that it's traceable, that's how they were able to, to find it and, and seize it. So whatever. Yeah. Um, all right. We try. Moving on. Price okay. report. Let's do it. All right. So um, oh, I don't really think nothing... uh, we have your screen. No ship. Oh, uh, yes, of course. I had it like almost set up and then I guess I got distracted like a squirrel. Share screen. Uh, Streamyard. All right, it should be good now. Hey, hey. Already. Already. People, yeah, so people not really listening, uh, just throwing it out there. Just just share, share, get the word out. Share the link, share the stream. I see somebody mentioning that. Yeah, we don't say that enough. Just uh, spread the word. Yeah, I always forget that. Sunita yeah. used to remind me all the time. And yes. I guess she just got tired of reminding me because <laughs> I kept forgetting to say it. <laughs> Um, yeah, and also if you're on YouTube, make sure that you click um, 1080p because uh, otherwise the charts will be all fuzzy. They're still kind of fuzzy. We really need 4K, but what are you going to do? Um, okay, so not really much happened um, this week. Like basically everything crashed just before we got on the horn last week, um, and then uh, and then basically it's just kind of stayed down. So for example, if we took a look at uh, at crypto BTC, um, you know, still kind of the Still the top dog, still at 50% dominance, um, crash down here, and then it's just kind of flat. Um, this looks kind of like a BART chart, but I don't know which way the next move is going to be. Um, so let's just kind of start with the wave magic, uh, which again is the standard deviation analysis. The white cluster is moving average, the blue cluster is upper standard deviation, and then the orange cluster are lower standard deviations. And again, it's from like across all of the different time frames, you know, 100 day, 1000 day, 50 day, you just overlay everything. So uh, this is a very common pattern that I see is where you'll break down um, the lower standard deviation. Um, and then right here was where it needed to basically get up um, and then stay up. It needed to start like oscillating kind of around here. But instead, the lower standard deviation acted as resistance and then it came back down. Um, honestly, this doesn't look very good. Um, there's still a lot of weakness out there. There are black swans now at this point, kind of, um, I don't know if they're circling, but you know, you can see them, you can see them in the sky. They, they look, they look like they could be interested. Uh, so I don't like how there was just kind of like this, this sort of like reaction bounce here. And you would, you, you kind of expected that this maybe should have gone a bit higher. Um, you can see that I've got this yellow, this yellow circle here. If we go to the daily, that, that circle will make a little bit more sense. Uh, let's clear the wave magic because this slows down the charts. Okay, so basically we've got this rising wedge that we broke down. We talked about this, um, identified this this chart pattern maybe somewhere in the middle here and said that that's really not good um, and that getting down to here was your signal really to get out, um, to not get trapped there. Usually on a pattern like this, you would kind of expect to try and revisit the underside. Um, typically that would have even already happened. Um, but unfortunately... Uh, I don't know. I just I wouldn't I wouldn't be convinced that price could really get much much higher than this area right here. I suppose that that perhaps it could, but um, we really are looking at the potential that that things could just keep going down. And probably that my my guess is that probably depends on some stuff that's happening with insiders, maybe with Binance. Um, we really don't know exactly what's going on behind the scenes there, but um, there is probably activity going on, and it's it's really it's not good. So, like my best hope. My best case hope scenario right now for price would be to get back into this area um, to try and test the convergence of that underside and and that 
uh, downsloping resistance. Um, but there's really no guarantee that that has to happen because there's plenty of other resistances that that could be hit before we actually get there, right? This right here is a spot that could be resistance. This could be resistance. Um, so anyways, yeah, I mean, that's not like great news here with price. Uh, sorry to, to be a negative Nancy, a, a Debbie Downer on that one. Um, let's take a look at the dollar because this one actually, this, this did break out and this is significant. So kind of like we talked about since, you know, for really for months now, um, that this looked to me like a pattern that was eventually going to break to the upside. It was going to break, uh, this resistance area here and that's effectively what's happened. So, um, in my mind, this is dollar strength. This is uh, Dixie strength and likely this will continue to play out. Um, I don't know exactly where, where the end of this run for the dollar will be, but, um, I mean, this is, you know, again, the, the dollar index typically being anti-correlated with risk assets like stocks and crypto. So um, one thing that, that has been nice to see, though, with the dollar index rising is that gold has actually kind of held its own. So um, this is the weekly chart on gold. Let's go to the daily. So we're dealing with congruent time frames. Uh, yeah. So, uh, I mean, gold did take a little bit of a hit, right? Gold did come down some. Um, oh, let's clear all the wave magic. There we go. It's causing everything to be slow. Okay, so gold did, did come down just a little bit, but um, I kind of, uh, I don't know why it escaped me this idea to do this, but I realized that what I could do is, is you could multiply gold by the dollar index. So it's kind of like, okay, when the dollar index rises, typically gold tends to go down. And, and you can really, you can see this here just comparing these two charts. So as the dollar index started rising, you can see on the right that gold was kind of at a, a local high, and then it's sort of been going down. Um, but lately it's, it's kind of rebounded actually, despite gold continuing to go up here in the, in the last few days. So one thing that you can do to kind of like neutralize this sort of anti-correlation is multiply them together, right? Because if gold is, let's suppose that gold stays the same price and the dollar index goes up, actually that means gold is doing quite well because you would normally ex expect gold to fall with the dollar index rising. Same thing in reverse. If the, if gold holds steady while the dollar index falls, well, gold isn't doing that great because with the dollar index falling, you'd expect it to rise. So if you multiply them together, you can kind of um, remove that, uh, uh, remove that um, sort of anti-correlation and then get kind of a, a different picture of how gold looks. And the interesting thing to me is that when you do this and you look at it on very long time frames, you actually see that gold has been consistently steadily rising, um, just, just regularly rising. A lot of that, so one one trick that I think that um, kind of the insiders, the corporate elite, you know, whatever, deep state, uh, one thing that these guys do is they love to hide the reality of what's happening in volatility. Um, so like there's a trend, there's a big trend, it can happen over the course of years or even decades sometimes, but they hide it in volatility. Um, and so this chart might be kind of an example of that, where it's like against the dollar index, like when you, when you factor that out, gold really has been continuing to rise um, just consistently over the years. So... <clears throat> that's kind of an interesting, interesting thing to do. It it may or might, may not mean that much, but um, you know, it's it, it's it is good to like try and find different charts, find different correlations if you can. Um, like like we've talked about, cross check is very important um, to sort of paint a picture and, and try and get an overall understanding of what's really happening. Um, so here's the gold versus silver ratio. So when this chart is moving up, that means gold is more valuable relative to silver. When it's going down, silver is being more valuable. Um, typically gold tends to spike relative to silver, at least on the paper price, uh, whenever we have like financial crises. So for example, March, 2020, um, right now, this is a sideways triangle. I can't decide if it wants to break up or it wants to break down. If it wants to break to the upside, that would indicate some sort of financial crisis brewing. Um, and if it wants to break down, that would indicate that, uh, gold prices are going to start popping, uh, and maybe commodity prices. Um, I really, in a lot of ways, I feel like with all the inflation that we've had, gold has not performed to the level that you would expect it to perform. However, I think back to 1971, and we can we can look at those charts, and you can see that. So when they sever, severed the gold standard, obviously, um, and when inflation really like kicked off, um, it it really did take a little bit of time for gold to get going, right? Like, um, maybe maybe not exactly, but like you can see that it it took some time here where it was just. Uh, oh wait, sorry, that's the gold silver ratio. Deep the uh, let's go to the monthly chart. But anyways, in, in the 1970s, like when inflation really started kicking off, it really did take some time before gold really started performing. Like, okay, it has some upside performance here. Um, but it was still 1972 before you started getting the 1973 before you really got like this, this big broad move. So, um, and again, with inflation of the seventies starting to kick off, 
Um, it, there was just kind of like this slight lag between that and gold performance. So um, I do think gold is like one of your safest assets to just like store value, to, to have your best chance of not losing value and not losing to inflation over long periods of time. Um, and I think the downside on gold is fairly limited. Um, <clears throat> but uh, it's, um, you know, it, at the same time, like they do try to manage the price. And I think that gold tends to perform nowadays when everything else also performs. So it's, it's hard to like get the counter cyclical move in. Uh, so anyways, this is the gold silver ratio. Um, still in the sideways triangle. We talked about this before. Um, it looks like, like right now it kind of looks like it wants to break down, right? Like this thing is kind of just flirting with the other side of this line. It hasn't really confirmed that it's, that it's breaking it down or anything. Um, but if this does break this line down convincingly, um, that would indicate that, uh, that we're going to start seeing gold prices move, uh, in short order. So, which is interesting because the Dixie wouldn't necessarily suggest that given that there's an anti-correlation, um, you would think, okay, well, if the Dixie has upward pressure, you, you would expect gold to, um, to not perform. So, um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's kind of a little bit of conflicting signal there, but I, I like the idea of holding gold, of being in gold and, um, and keeping a significant portion of your stack. If you're trying to play it safe, um, you know, maybe you've got more risky plays that you want to make. If you're trying to turn, you know, a hundred thousand into a million, or if you really, if you got a million, you're trying to turn it into 10 million so you could be baller, you know, um, you might take some extra risks, you know, but Hey, I mean, if you got a million dollars, do you really want to take that much risk? Although how much is a million these days, right? It's barely enough to, to claim you're tired. Um, let's see. Okay. So we've got the, uh, federal reserve overnight repurchase agreements. And, um, we talked about this being kind of a bottoming pattern here last week. Uh, this took a sharp drop in the last two days. If you see this thing rebound to the upside next week, uh, that's definitely a bottoming pattern and expect it to go to go up um, a lot of times. <clears throat> and again, with charts, like you still have to understand the fundamentals behind it. No one is like this isn't a chart where you like clean out the longs and clean out the shorts with big spikes. But um, uh, it's it's kind of like it's related to those things happening. And it it's sort of a liquidity basket, if you will, for big players to to make big moves. Um, so. This right here probably signifies that some big move was made uh, into some kind of asset. It's hard to say which one. Um, my guess <clears throat> is that that probably wouldn't be stocks because, um, uh, or may maybe it would have been. I don't know. Actually, sorry. I, I take that back. It erase that. Forget that. Um, okay. 10-year yield. Uh, we're still kind of like waiting to, to break out, you know, to fresh higher highs. I, I guess technically that was, was a slightly higher high. Um, so as the 10-year 10 10 yield goes up, that means the value of bonds are going down. Um, you would expect that this is probably, this chart's going to break to the upside even further. I think the fed is interested in raising rates more. So, uh, yeah, I mean, the other thing too, is like this chart wants to go up because that right there was a shooting star wick. Um, and then things kind of like that capped things, but you'll notice like if you were to draw that, that horizontal resistance there, like it's already well above and it's closed well above that, uh, that previous close price. So this, this chart is strength, um, expect rates to go up, um, Normally, again, you would say rates going up, the, bo the bond market going down means that people are going to push money into the stock market. But, um, you know, the stock market kind of has its own problems right now. Um, so this being the uh, the NASDAQ, um, basically, we, you know, had a big breakout, came and tested the bottom, tried to come back up. And now prices are kind of, again, testing uh, this. What was resistance is now support, um, but it's like kind of double tapping support. So, um you know, you kind of think that this is going to break down eventually. Maybe it'll do something like that uh, and then and then break to the downside. Um, although it's, you know, it's always dangerous to call the stock market, to call a top in the stock market because the thing just goes up and up and up. Um, but I mean, it does have pullbacks. It takes periodic pullbacks. So it, it's possible that, um, and, I, and I think it's even likely, like I said, it's kind of dangerous to call tops in the stock market. It's kind of dangerous to, to bet on it going down. Um, but uh, I mean, it does seem to me reasonable and likely that we could expect the stock market to sort of get back into this channel because that's that's really that's the more rational place for it to exist. All of this is kind of exuberance. Um, so that's just something to think about with stocks. You know, you might do something like take a um, if you didn't want to sell your stocks, you might take some kind of binary option um, that's out of the money and uh, put some small amount, some small percentage of your stack on it as kind of like a hedge. Um, so that's like one strategy. There's a lot of different strategies you can use. Uh, nothing really happened with the uh, with the financials. <clears throat> I guess we got the new um, Federal Reserve balance sheet assets. We get them every week, uh, and they dropped just slightly. Not much to see here. Uh, we'd already kind of talked about Bitcoin, so let's go straight to Monero. That's the inverted yield curves. Or what's going? Is that uh, has that gotten worse, or what's going on with that? 
buddy, did I lose you? Hello. <laughs> what is that? That was my soundboard. <laughs> That's the wrong button. I'm trying to unmute. What happened? I lost body. Body? Yeah. Um. Hello, hello. Did you mute him? No. Oh, he's gone. <laughs> oh. Okay. What happened there? All right. Well, we'll yeah, wait for dropped. body to come back. Oh, he's back. We still got a screen though. <laughs> See if you get him back up. Body. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. I don't know what happened there. Yeah, I didn't press anything. Nothing changed. And I, I could hear y'all, but um anyway, so I reloaded the uh, web page. Yeah, I was just asking the inverted yield curves. Is there uh any new information on that? Are they are they getting worse, better in terms of their inversion? Yeah. Just uh just more sideways chop. This is the daily here. We'll expand this. So uh, obviously the white line here is uh, that's zero. Anything below that is inverted. A mm. um, little bit of a spike here in the past month, but um, yeah, I mean nothing really. It's just sideways chop basically. So uh, I, mean, I mean again, I, I, you know, how are you, how are you feeling about it overall though? Like I mean, do you think it's it's like what what are the odds you're giving that this inverted yield curve is indicative of a you know, a recession at this point. Obviously, people have been calling for it for quite a long time. But how, how are you currently feeling about it? I think that the danger or the risk of a recession is maybe a little bit higher. It seems like it's growing. The housing market has slowed down significantly. People don't want to sell because they've got their low interest rates. People don't want to buy because they don't want to get that really high interest rate. So the housing market, just the volume is dropping off significantly. Um, but you know, that kind of, in some way it might just sort of lock prices where they are as opposed to, um, you know, causing prices to go one way or the other, right. There's not much supply, but there's not much demand. Um, at the same time, like with the federal reserve reverse repo facility, um, I think that that, that tends to drive the yield curve, right? That's, that mm -hmm. tends to, that tends to drive yields higher and higher because, you know, when you've got basically free interest rates at risk free overnight, like you're getting the federal funds rate for one day, you know, for just minus 0.1%, but you're basically getting the federal funds rate for one day bonds is effectively like in my mind, that's how I think about that. And I know technically that's not exactly true, but it, it basically drives the yield curve to stay high. I think it, it's driving that yield curve and, and all of these rates to stay somewhat close, more closely pegged um, to the federal funds rate. So that being the case, it's like, okay, are, is that gonna is that gonna keep things where they are? Is that gonna stabilize things? Is that gonna keep the yield curve here um, inverted? Because you know, like two thousand six, two thousand seven, yield curve being inverted, we weren't in a recession yet. Um, in fact, everything was still going up. So, I I'm not sure that the yield curve right now necessarily indicates that we're gonna have a recession around the corner. Mm. Um, could, could it pretend, I mean, this is, you know, probably a uh, long shot thinking here. Could it, could it potentially indicate that there's something bre brewing, like some kind of black swan event, um, you know, where, where some people have the information already that are, that are way ahead of us, you know, like it, there's rumors now that, right, that there's going to be a ramp up in the the COVID stuff again that we may go back until I mean these are these are really kind of long shot rumors but I do see anecdotally like things starting to ramp up a little bit um do you think like it could be indicative of something like that like there's a a, a downturn uh by way of the government imposing it on people I mean it definitely is a data point on that side like no doubt about it. Historically like, speaking, before, before 2020, before the COVID lockdowns, I, I think there was a yield curve inversion then, right? Yeah, let's go ahead and take a look at that. Um, backwards, backwards. Um, no, actually, it, it doesn't look like it. So the yield curve wasn't, oh. it almost was inverted. It had gotten like, I think some yield curves had flipped. So like maybe the two year versus the 10 year or like the one year versus the 10 year. Mm. Um, because when they, you know, when you hear yield curve inversion, um, usually they're just comparing a pair, 
right? They're just looking at one yield uh, maturity length versus the other. But there's, you can see on the left here, I mean, there's three months, six months, one year, two year, five, 10, right. 30. Ones are so, right. Yeah. The, the pink line sort of aggregates all that together. Um, so you can have like individual pairs invert, even if like broadly the yield curve is not inverted. So mm -hmm. um, I think there was inversions happening in 19, uh, 2019 and 2020, but I yeah. don't think we were like, we weren't like broadly inverted, um, but we, it did get pretty close to, to zero. Yeah, I'm just throwing it out there as a theory, if it's potentially indicative of some kind of event that's about to happen. So maybe not just like a a recession that's maybe caused by some event, you know, but uh, one thing that would be indicative of that. So if you take a look here at, at all the different yields, uh, the colored lines and then the white line, the the white line is obviously the federal funds rate. Um, mm -hmm. You'll notice that they like took a steep dive down and started dropping off. So when yields are dropping, that means the value of the bonds increasing because um, as people are piling into bonds, um, that rate doesn't have to be as high. The person offering them, usually you know the treasury, doesn't have to offer an attractive interest rate anymore because everyone wants their bonds. Um, so they, they lower those rates um, so that they don't have to pay as much in the future. So you'll notice, uh, look at this like February um, of, sorry, February, 21st 2020 is when these yields started cratering mm -hmm. and um there's march 2nd right and then really i think it was march 4th no, no i guess it was march 2nd it was this week it was march like the beginning of march 2nd that was like the beginning of um like the where they said hey we're gonna shut things down we're gonna lock things yeah. down oh my god it's terrible you know that's where the news cycle really really took off so to but me but it started I guess, before that right it started even before the march right is what you're saying like the downturn happened before that before yeah, you can general knowledge exactly so yeah. like you can kind of broadly see that yields were meandering on down but then when they took this really sharp sell-off that's like this is again kind of why i tell you guys like sometimes i'll point things out on charts and like you'll have to look at them for yourself in the middle of the week because uh you know it's by the time that we can get here on the horn on saturday and talk about it it's probably too late especially for a signal like this, because this signal, when you see like these massive drops like this, it happens and you've got maybe 24 hours to get out of the market. Because um, the problem is like, you wouldn't look at this sort of like down chop and say, oh, this is bad. You know, things are, you know, things are about to really crash. You're just like, ah, things are just pulling back. You know, maybe they'll, maybe they'll reverse to the upside here. But it's, you know, basically from that February 19th moment to February um, 20, 28th or uh, March 2nd, Okay, so maybe you've got a week there as things like really curled under and started crashing. Um, you'll notice the the yield curve kind of bounced to the upside, but you know that's not really like this wasn't a super sharp bounce to the upside. But the fact that it was correcting to the upside while bond rates were falling was like a massive signal. That's like that's such mm -hmm. a huge signal. Like you just get out, you smash the sell button, you don't think about it, and then you probably take some kind of option or you take some kind of short on the entire market with some small percentage of your stack. Um, you might take like small percentage, but high leverage um, and say, hey, if I lose it, if the markets bounce back, OK, whatever. But, um, you know, you're you're effectively protecting yourself. So mm. that's that's the signal that you want to see if you're like if you're really concerned that some um, big financial event is in the works um, is the all of these yields will just curl over and then crash um, because everyone will just be piling into the quote unquote safety of bonds. So mm -hmm. I, I think that's in my mind, that's that's the way I look at this yield curve chart. Got it. Yeah. So. Feels like we're on the precipice of that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, I feel but, like an old man talking about bonds. <laughs> <laughs> well, back in my day, we bought bonds, supported <laughs> the war effort. Exactly. All right. <laughs> okay. So uh, let's move on to Monero. Um, so we had some interesting price action with ratio on Monero. Uh, actually, let's go to the let's go to the dollar price. Clear the wave magic. Oops. Okay. So uh, yeah, I mean, Monero crashed with everything else, but interestingly enough, it um, at first Monero crashed less uh, than like Bitcoin, for example, um, and then uh, and then it crashed more somehow, which was sort of this part right there, which uh, I, I think is just you know that's just screwing around with the price. Um, interestingly enough, you can you can kind of see that story being told here on the um, uh, on the uh, the divergences. So basically, all everything diverged up as the price was rising and then went back to flat and then everything diverged to the downside um, relative to Kraken. Again, obviously um, all of the other shitcoin exchanges. 
Um, they all diverged to the downside and that brought Monero down. And now it's like, I don't know, I guess they're coming back to the upside. Um, this chart now suddenly seems like it's it's being reflective of um, like some of the price movements, whereas for the past few months, I felt like it, it hasn't been all that correlated. Um, but anyways, so I, I do think like this was just kind of BS. Um, you can even kind of see it in the Z scores. Uh, all right. So Monero US dollar, you can even kind of see it in the Z scores where we had uh, a lower low uh, on price, but then sort of the Z scores were already recovering. The momentum was already recovering. So um, yeah, I think most of this move down here was just kind of volatility. You know, maybe it's clearing out some shorts, clearing out some longs, et cetera. Um, there's probably not that too many people, too much volume trading Monero. Um, so, you know, it's there's probably money to be scalped there if you're a market maker. Um, so yeah, the ratio still looks, I mean, to me, this still looks like a bottoming pattern. This still looks like, um, it wants to reverse in a lot of ways to me, it looks like, oh crap, look, we, uh, you know, we broke through this kind of downsloping resistance. Let's try and slam it back to the downside, uh, with some trickery and buy some time. Who knows? Maybe these guys even lose money on this proposition, but to them, uh, it's worth it because they keep people distracted into other coins, uh, and into Bitcoin, things like that. So it, it's, it's possible that that kind of thing goes through their mind when some of these uh, nefarious market makers are deciding, you know, moments they want to try and mess with the price. I do think that Monero has significant support. I think it has significant organic support at like kind of the 130, 150 level um, to the point that I think that market makers that want to try and push price down below that um, have to contend with these economic realities. And my guess is they, they probably have to spend money to do that. Um, I'm completely speculating here. So, but, you know, that's, I, I'm making inferences. Um, they're highly speculative. So just know that I'm not, you know, I'm not right there making the case, trying to say like, I'm a true believer in that <laughs> scenario, or whatever. But anyways, um, Monero US dollar, the chart does look like overall, if we're just doing, you know, a chart astrology, this thing does look like it's ready to break this, this, this line right here. Um, it's ready to start bumping up against this kind of horizontal uh, area of significance, this horizontal resistance that we've seen. And ultimately, I do expect this thing to break to the upside, which again is why I, another point in favor of why we should be concerned about the broader markets and whether or not um, the stocks and crypto have can put on any new local highs for the meantime, at least for the next few months. Um, so would love to see, you know, would love to see some big breakouts, break these lines and then get right back to that point one area. That would be so good. That would be so bullish if that happens. Um, right. So essentially this, uh, the point nine areas, the point nine to um, point one area, point nine five is really like, like that's pretty strong resistance. That's very strong resistance. It's probably possible even that we would have to get up here and then come back down and do something like this with like a rising triangle before Monero could actually really like hardcore breakouts of the upside. You'll notice that sort of, that could correspond with the 2025 bull market. If we're, you know, if we're going to go with the pleb, the pleb level four year cycle, which, you know, seems, seems, seems possible. seems plausible. We've got 2025. There could be potentially a new president coming in. Maybe that's more friendly to crypto. That could drive a lot of uh, momentum. We should see the end uh, or the resolution of a lot of these legal attacks. Um, so it, 2025 still like, I mean, it, it's possible. It, it could happen. If we start seeing the signs line up, um, you know, we'll, we'll prepare ourselves for a bull market, um, which, uh, will will definitely mean you know Monero, um, but I'm not gonna lie, a bull market will involve shit coins, uh, whose profits we will roll into Monero uh, down the line. So long term chart there. Uh, let's see, we'll take a look at our at our inverse head and shoulders. You know the 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 hopium here this is like the biggest Monero hopium chart that we got. Big inverse head and shoulders. We want to see this line break. The breaking of this line is also something that I think we can use um, in a social sense. We can plaster this chart across social media and say, look at this massive inverse head and shoulders. Um, inverse head and shoulders or head and shoulders patterns are actually very reliable. I've, I was very suspicious of them. I didn't really look at them too much for quite a few years here. Um, but the more that I've seen them, the more I just like, wow, they just more almost almost all the time. Like I would say 80 to 90 percent of the time you get a good head and shoulders pattern like this, they almost always break to the direction they're supposed to. So if we break this line, like that's definitely socially useful to be like, hey guys, look, crypto people, Monero number go up, <laughs> you know, be, being careful, of course, not to get ourselves trapped in those, um, in those dubious psycho psychological mechanisms where we only care about number go up. But um, thank you, Maxis, for teaching us that. Uh, you know, I might've not learned that lesson quite so strongly <laughs> without the events of the past couple of years. Uh, 
We could also take a look at Monero versus Ethereum. Um, this this chart looks like it's basically stabilizing here at these lower standard deviation bands, and I imagine that Monero going up relative to Bitcoin, relative to, to total, also implies Monero going up relative to Ethereum. Um, although the only thing is with this chart here, um, you would we could maybe get to these these upper bands right there, and that's going to eventually pose resistance. Like if we break out relative to Ethereum, that will pose resistance for the Monero versus Ethereum chart, which in a lot of ways kind of makes sense. Um, under the thesis that Ethereum is going to outperform Bitcoin, that it's only it's going to flip Bitcoin in the next bull market, unless Bitcoin pulls a rabbit out of the hat. I just I don't see them. The, the one thing that might work in their favor is they've got NFTs now, so they, they've got a lot of on-chain degeneracy that can help their price. So, uh, you know, maybe may, maybe that that gives them a little bit longer of a holdout. But I still just it, it's nothing that you can do on Bitcoin ordinals and inscriptions is as efficient. Um, and integratedly useful as Ethereum does. So, uh, and we know that crypto is so much about a lot of this degeneracy. So, Ethereum is going to be the platform that enables that. But they'll also build out interesting things as well, like other types of financial infrastructure. So, um, that's that's in the cards. That's coming. Um, it's still a lot of development still happening. Ethereum layer two is still permission. They still got admin keys. They could still hypothetically clean your funds out, rug you if they want. Um, but I, I do think it makes a lot of sense that. The bigger players are probably not going to rug, you know, the billions and billions of dollars inside of layer two. I think it makes more sense to them to keep collecting fees, to keep being in control of a new budding ecosystem and to eventually some of these layer twos, these roll-ups, uh, that's the big deal is roll-ups. I think some of these roll-ups will eventually get the admin keys removed and be trustless platforms. Um, so, but we'll just have to see. That's probably still years away. Again, um, you know, we've got half of this year and then we've got 2024 until we finally come to you know 2025. So there is still plenty of time for a lot of these developments to happen. Um, markets often tend to move slowly. So, um, you know, I think overall, I, I think guys, we should effectively be prepared for sideways chop um, in Monero, sideways chop in Bitcoin and crypto um, with kind of some negative down pressures here over the coming months where um, probably the, the range needs to be established to some downside. We need to, to reestablish some kind of support um, you know, at a higher low than, than last year. Um, and then it'll probably just range. We'll come to the upside, maybe, you know, start getting close to 30 K again on Bitcoin and then, you know, kind of range back down. And I think that could be like the story effectively of, of from here through maybe the next 12 months. Um, so in that kind of market, it's hard to make money. It's a lot easier to make money in a trending market. Uh, in a sideways market, you have to pick tops and bottoms, and then you never know if maybe it's going to break out and you just, you know, you sold before the big breakout. Um, so, you know, that's just a kind of broad level picture there, broad level um, strategy, thinking about, you know, when you get into markets, obviously the easiest thing is just to keep DCA, make, have a real business, make fiat, drop it into crypto, savings, gold, et cetera. Uh, and that's your that's your easiest strategy to, to keep getting gains. But uh, if you're a dirty trader or if you pay attention to this stuff, you can take advantage when you get a blow off top in progress and, you know, scale out DCA to the downside, DCA out of the risk assets and then DCA back in, you know, at the bottom. Um, you might hold off on your DCA right now and wait for lower prices um, or not. You know, you could just keep buying no matter what. So uh, I guess that's about all I got for you guys, unless um, unless you guys wanted to talk about anything else. No, no. Awesome, brother. That's that's great. As always, stick around, though, if you can. I know we'll be talking about the tornado cash stuff, and I know you had some some good insights into that this week on Twitter. So it'd be great if you could stick around for that. Cool. Yeah, I might have to bounce out for a little bit, but I'll, I'll try and get back on here in an hour. All right, cool. All right, buddy. Thank you so much. Right, thanks, buddy. Thank you. For the dude astrology. I always love that. <laughs>